All right, so in the previous lecture, we uh, finished looking at Hohmann transfers and application of Hohmann transfers uh, in terms of uh, transfer of spacecraft from uh, low Earth parking orbits to geostationary orbits. Uh, the next topic uh, in orbital maneuvers <coughs> is the so-called bioelectric transfer. <coughs> now, the bioelectric transfer is also used for coplanar circular orbits but unlike the Hohmann transfer it is not a two burn maneuver so as you know you know the Hohmann transfer involves two impulses and among all two impulse transfers between coplanar circular orbits the Hohmann transfer is the most fuel efficient now the bioelectric transfer involves three burns all right and there are two transfer ellipses that are involved uh, in moving from one circular orbit to another and so since it is not a two impulse burn uh, we cannot really do apples to apples comparison of, of the Hohmann transfer of the bioelectric transfer but uh, if you just look at the end result in terms of the total delta V that is needed to uh, transfer the spacecraft from one circular orbit to another it turns out that the bioelectric transfer is sometimes more efficient than the Hohmann transfer. All right. All right. So let us start by looking at the geometry of the bioelectric transfer. As in the Hohmann transfer, again, the initial and final orbits are coplanar and circular. So here's your initial orbit, and here's the final orbit, both circular. Uh, this is the focus F. The starting point for the bioelectric transfer is the point P and the first transfer is made into a transfer ellipse that reaches way further out than the final orbit. Okay. So here's the initial orbit. Uh, this is OI. This is the final orbit OF and I'm going to call the first transfer ellipse TE1. So the first transfer goes from point P all the way out to point Q. And then at point Q a transfer is made into a second transfer ellipse. So let me use a little bit in color here. And this orbit reaches out to the final orbit and meets it point R. Okay. So this is TE2 and as you can see there are three burns that are involved. The first burn takes place at point P, this is delta V1, the second at point Q, delta V2, the third which is the circularization burn in the end point R. Okay. So the motivation behind a uh, bioelectric transfer is <clears throat> comes from our uh, our concluding analysis on the Hohmann transfer when <clears throat> the final orbit OF becomes so large that it tends to uh, that, the, that its radius tends to infinity. So what what we saw was that what happens there is that as the final orbit starts becoming large the delta V that is required, the delta V2 <clears throat> that is required goes to zero, right? So the Hohmann transfer becomes cheaper and cheaper and then flattens out to delta V escape. So that is what is uh, kind of exploited here. The first transfer ellipse ideally uh, would tend to infinity and then <clears throat> the second transfer infinite, uh, ellipse would come back from infinity and meet the final orbit at point R with the motivation that if indeed it did reach infinity, the delta V2 required at point Q would tend to zero. Okay, and that again, like I said, comes from our analysis of the Hohmann transfer. So, <clears throat> with, with that in mind, <clears throat> let us look at how uh, the delta V that is needed to go from OI to o OF varies as the point Q is varied. Uh, towards and away from F. 
Now it is completely up to us to uh, place where the point Q goes on the common line of apsides and uh, based on our uh, analysis of the Hohmann transfer it seems like the farther Q is away from the focus uh, the smaller the delta V will be for this entire maneuver. Now there is obviously a downside to that in the sense that as we start moving Q farther and farther away the periods of the transfer ellipse 1 and transfer ellipse 2 will start rising as it is they are quite high right so this is a very leisurely maneuver okay so for 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 the most part the bioelectric transfer is looked upon as essentially an an academic problem and not so much of a practice it doesn't have so much of a practical application because of the fact that it just takes way too long even though the delta v is small <clears throat> all right so it is not very difficult to uh, do the analysis of the delta v's that are involved here so let us uh, compute all the individual delta v's and uh, do a comparison between the bioelectric transfer and the Hohmann transfer. All right. So, like I said, uh, the point Q it's totally up to us where we place it. So let us call this distance F Q R A, which is the apoapsis radius of uh, the transfer ellipse one as well as transfer ellipse two. Right, so R A is a design parameter and it is up to us to give it a value. Okay, all right. So now let me get rid of this picture and you can uh, refer back to figure one in your notes. All right, so R A is the apoapsis of transfer ellipse 1 and transfer ellipse 2 and it is a design parameter okay all right so the semi major axis of transfer ellipse 1 is ri the arithmetic mean of the radius of the initial orbit and the apoapsis radius of the transfer ellipses and similarly the semi major axis of the second transfer ellipse is rf plus ra over 2. So if you look at the figure, figure 1, it becomes uh, very easy to see this. And of course, uh, the velocity on the initial orbit, it's a circular orbit, so vi is square root mu over r, uh, ri, and Vf is the velocity on the final orbit Of the square root mu over Rf. Now we have been using the ratio between the initial and final orbits in our analysis of the of the Hohmann transfer. So let's continue to do that and uh, we get the following relationship: Vf is one over square root alpha. Vi. Uh, I had used the variable chi in the previous set of notes. Here I'm using alpha. Uh, so alpha is defined as Rf over Ri. We had called this chi previously. So let us redefine that as alpha. All right. Now there is another radius that is involved here, namely Ra. Right. So we will need another parameter. To be defined, we call it beta. This is the ratio of the apoapsis of the transfer ellipses to the initial radius. Okay, this is the definition. Since R A is a design parameter, it means that beta is also a design parameter, right? Because R I is fixed. So instead of choosing R A, it is uh, uh, custom in uh, you know bioelectric transfer analysis to choose this ratio as the design parameter okay all right so now uh, I'm not going to go into the finer details and I'll simply give you the final expression for the Delta V because it's you know very straightforward to do the computation all the three Delta V's are exactly as in the Hohmann transfer they are all tangential uh, the first Delta V is from 
the initial orbit to transfer ellipse 1, the second delta v is from transfer ellipse 1 to transfer ellipse 2, and the final third delta v is from transfer ellipse 2 to the final orbit, right? So delta v total by elliptic is delta v at point P, the first one, delta v point Q plus delta v point R. And uh, this magnitude depends on the initial velocity, just like the Hohmann transfer. And as you, as you can suspect, it will depend on the ratio alpha, but it will also depend now uh, on the ratio beta. So we have two alpha plus beta, alpha beta minus 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 beta <clears throat> all right so this is the total delta v that is required for um, the bielectric transfer now also, there's a uh, uh, common practice to uh, give the delta v as a ratio of the magnitude of delta v to the initial velocity. That kind of takes away the effect of the initial orbit, right? And you get a non dimensional number. So the delta v divided by the initial velocity is given by these two ratios where recall alpha is rf to ri and beta is ra to ri okay now uh, if you remember we said that uh, uh, the total delta v that is needed for uh, a bielectric transfer becomes smaller and smaller as the point q is moved farther and further okay so it makes sense to look at the limit limit q tends to infinity now if q tends to infinity look at figure one it means that r a tends to infinity right the transfer both the transfer ellipses reach all the way out to infinity which is the so it means that beta tends to infinity Okay, so in this limit, it is not very difficult to show that here's the sum delta VP plus delta VQ plus delta VR. Uh, each one of these delta Vs uh, will tend to a limit. So VP, right? P, at point P, you are sending the spacecraft from the initial orbit to transfer ellipse 1. Now, as the transfer ellipse 1's point Q goes to infinity, it means the transfer ellipse 1 is not really an ellipse. Just like in a Hohmann transfer, it becomes a parabola. So, delta VP will be equal to delta V escape at point P. Right? In the limit that Q tends to infinity. Now, at point Q, point Q lies at infinity, right? So transfer ellipse 1 and transfer ellipse 2 are really transfer parabola 1 and transfer parabola 2. And at, on the parabola, the speed of the spacecraft is 0 at infinity, right? So the transfer from one uh, parabola 1 number 1 to par parabola number 2, there is no effort needed. That goes to 0. And finally, you're coming back now on transfer parabola 2 back to the final orbit right so the delta v r is going to be equal to delta v escape at point r right uh, an easier way to look at it is if the spacecraft was already at r and you wanted to send it out to point q right that would be delta v escape r 
but this is the reverse process in which the spacecraft is coming back from infinity to the point R. So the delta V required is basically exactly the same. Okay, so, so here's what we have in the limit that uh, the point Q tends to infinity or R A tends to infinity or beta tends to infinity. So we have limit beta tends to infinity delta V V E total is equal to we know that the escape velocity at point P is that because point P lies on the initial orbit and escape at point R is that because point R lies on the final orbit right Vf is the speed on the final orbit and so we can reduce this again in terms of everything in terms of Vi Vi over square root alpha and therefore limit delta Vb over Vi as beta tends to infinity is equal to <clears throat> 1 plus square root alpha over alpha square root 2 minus 1. Okay, so this is the behavior of the bioelectric transfer as uh, the apoapsis of the transfer ellipsis tends to infinity. And as you can imagine, this represents the least delta V that is needed using uh, a bioelectric transfer, okay, which is a three impulse maneuver. All right, so, the, so you should uh, be very clear about this when we, when we talk about the efficiency of a Hohmann transfer and we say that a Hohmann transfer is the most fuel efficient maneuver between two coplanar circular orbits we are talking only about all possible two impulse burns right so we are not saying that the Hohmann transfer is the most fuel efficient burn between uh, transfer between two coplanar circular orbits period okay it's the most fuel efficient two impulse transfer so bioelectric transfer can be more fuel efficient than a Hohmann transfer and to complete the analysis of the bioelectric transfer we need to do a comparison of how it uh, fares against uh, the Hohmann transfer. All right. So just to refresh our memories, uh, the total delta V for a Hohmann transfer, and I'm going to normalize it with the initial speed was equal to 1 over square root alpha minus all right where alpha again is rf to ri and we have now a corresponding uh, uh, equation for the bioelectric I'm not going to write this again. This is a function of alpha, beta, alpha and beta, right? So the question obviously is, when is it true that delta VB is less than delta V Hohmann? Okay, when does this happen? So the answer to this question is given in figure number two. And that figure, if you look at, uh, at your notes, has been drawn by uh, essentially doing a computational exercise of plotting the total delta V for both the Hohmann and the bioelectric maneuvers for various alpha values of alpha and beta. And then just identifying the regions of alpha and beta where Hohmann is better or where the bioelectric maneuver is better. All right, so in this picture, the x-axis is the ratio alpha, which was defined as Rf over Ri, 
and the y-axis is beta, which was Ra over Ri. Okay. <clears throat> so the scales are slightly different. They both start out at 1. And beta is 20. And so on and on the x-axis we have 5, 10, 15. So the line alpha equal to beta meets at this point. Okay. This is the line alpha is equal to beta. Now, there is a locus of points along which the delta V required, the total delta V required for both the bioleptic and the Hohmann transfers is the same. All right. So that uh, locus is asymptotic to ratio alpha. Let me draw this line here at 11.94 and that will help me draw the locus of points where the bioleptic is equal to the Hohmann transfer. Okay. Alright, so there are uh, three important observations to be made here. So this line is uh, the, the locus of points where the delta V is the same for the two maneuvers to the left of this line in this region to the left of this asymptote the Hohmann transfer is more efficient okay which makes sense because we expect Hohmann transfer to be uh, more fuel efficient when the uh, the trans the the two orbits between which the transfer is taking place are relatively close to each other. Okay, only when the the final orbit starts growing in size, we see that uh, the delta V is required uh, start decreasing for bioelectric transfers. All right, so to the left of this dotted line here, uh, stationed at 11.94, uh, the Hohmann transfer is more efficient. Okay, so this is true for alpha less than equal to 11.94 all right then the second observation is that to the right of this point which is about 15.58 to the right of this point the bioelectric transfer is more efficient This is alpha greater than or equal to 15.58. So these two distinct regions exist. And then there is this intermediate region between 11.94 and 15.58 in which uh, the Hohmann transfer and the bioelectric transfer may be better than one another depending on how big beta is chosen for a fixed alpha. Okay, so for alpha between 11.94 and 15.58, let me pick say alpha equal to, for example, I have 13 in the notes. So let me pick alpha equal to 13 right here. So we know that uh, to the left of this locus of points where delta V is the same, so let me say delta V V E equal to delta V H. To the left of that line, right here, the Hohmann transfer is more efficient, whereas to the right of this line, in this region, the bioelectric transfer is more efficient. Okay, so the breaking point is right here, and it turns out that that value is 48.9. So beta equal to 48.9. So here's how I read this chart. At alpha equal to 13, right, all these points 
I'm going to draw with blue. All these blue points, each of the betas that correspond to the blue line, if the beta chosen is less than 48.9, I lie to the left of this solid line, which is the locus of points where delta Vs are the same. Since I lie to the left of it, the Hohmann transfer is more efficient. All right. Whereas if the beta chosen is more than 48.9, which is right here, right? All these betas are more than 48.9. I lie to the right of this locus and therefore the bi-elliptic transfer is more efficient, okay? So in the intermediate range between 11.9 and 15.5, it depends on how big the intermediate transfer ellipse is, okay? So if the apoapsis of the intermediate transfer ellipses is large enough, then the bi-elliptic will be more efficient and it doesn't really matter if you know the alpha is greater than is, is is big enough by itself okay so if the final orbit is more than 15.6 times uh, the initial orbit in radius then the bilip transfer will be more efficient than the Hohmann transfer ir irrespective of what beta is chosen all right and if we are to the left of 11.94 then the Hohmann transfer is always more efficient so so far uh, in the, our study of orbital transfers between uh, coplanar circular orbits, we have looked at uh, Hohmann transfers, which we saw are the most fuel efficient maneuvers possible between, uh, most fuel efficient two impulse maneuvers possible between uh, coplanar circular orbits. And then uh, we expanded our horizons to look at the bi-elliptic transfers, which are three impulse maneuvers, and we found that in certain situations they can be more fuel efficient than the Hohmann transfer uh, when the initial and final orbits are circular and coplanar but in return uh, they cost a lot more time than the Hohmann transfer. Uh, in this section we will look at uh, fast transfers between coplanar orbits and we will generalize a little bit in the sense that the initial orbit will still be a circle but the final orbit will be uh, taken to be an ellipse and uh, the key fact here is that uh, the transfer arc between the initial and final orbit will not between the initial and final orbits will not be half the transfer ellipse like it was in the Hohmann transfer uh, we will look at much shorter transfer ar arcs between the initial and final orbits so uh, to begin our study of the non Hohmann transfers, uh, uh, look at figure 3 in part 4 of the notes. So let me draw that again here. Uh, the geometry of the problem that we are studying here is the following. So we have an initial orbit which is a circle with F as the focus and the final orbit is an ellipse. So the final orbit looks something like this. Is an ellipse. And the transfer from the initial orbit uh, of radius R1 to the final orbit takes place through a transfer arc, which let me draw that using marker the transfer arc is a part of a large ellipse that looks something like that we'll come back So this is figure 3 in uh, part 4 of the notes. So we have assumed certain things here. So this line that you see is the line of apsides for the final orbit and we are going to assume that this line of apsides for the final orbit is also the line of apsides for the transfer ellipse. Okay. So the blue one here is the transfer ellipse. Uh, 
Of course, the entire transfer ellipse is not traversed by the spacecraft, right? Only the solid portion which goes from point A to point B is what is covered, is what, what is traversed by the spacecraft. So as you can see, if point B were over here, right, that would be our orthodox, the standard Hohmann transfer. Now, the drawback of the Hohmann transfer, as you know, when, when, when we looked at it, was that sometimes it's, it takes too much time. Even though it's the most fuel efficient two impulse maneuver, it sometimes can be way too long to, uh, to complete. So what we are doing here is that in order to gain some time, the transfer arc has been shortened. But what we will soon discover is that the price to pay for this is going to be a much larger delta V than com as compared with the Hohmann transfer. All right. So A to B is the transfer arc. which is a part of the transfer ellipse and this is OI and this is OF our standard nomenclature for the initial and final orbits and we are going to define a new angle phi which is the transfer angle and the transfer angle is the angle by the transfer arc on the line of apsides. Okay, so line of apsides, according to our assumption, is the same for OF and this is TE, the transfer ellipse, and TE. That's an assumption. All right, so we'll see if that assumption can be satisfied. So from the point of view of analysis, uh, one of the things, the one of the other things that we need to note here is that uh, at point, there are two delta V's, right, just like in the Hohmann transfer, but it is only the first delta V that you see at point A, which, which is a tangential burn, right, because the transfer ellipse and the initial orbits are tangential to each other at point A, but the second delta V that takes place at point B is no longer a tangential burn. Right? So that is where the additional cost in terms of uh, delta V comes in because you not only do you need to change the magnitude of the velocity vector but also rotate it so that you know the, the, the velocity vector post burn uh, belongs to the final orbit. So on the transfer ellipse maybe this is what the velocity vector would look like V T B. Whereas on the final orbit, the velocity vector may look something like that, V F B, the velocity on the final orbit at, at point B, meaning that the delta V that is involved is this vector, is delta V at B. As you can see, this is clearly not a tangential burn, right? And that is what leads to the extra cost over the home and transfer. So uh, in order to carry out the analysis for this short, uh, short transfer in terms of time, uh, let us first look at uh, the design of the transfer ellipse. All right, so the first step for the non human transfer is to design the transfer arc. And uh, so we have the figure right there. Uh, it's slightly small, but uh, you can refer to figure three uh, to uh, compare with the equations that we're gonna have. All right, so the step one is design of the transfer ellipse or the transfer arc A to B. Now, keep in mind that the underlying assumption is that the line of apsides, which is this green line, is shared by the final orbit and the transfer ellipse. Okay, so the immediate consequence of that is that I can use this line to measure the true anomaly of all points on both the transfer ellipse and on the final orbit, right? So that is key. So for example, the point B is common between the 
is, is common uh, between the final orbit OF and transfer ellipse DE. Since both OF and DE have the same line of apsides, the true anomaly of point B, as you can see, is phi. It is phi both on OF and on TE, right? Because the line of apsides is common. So that is going to be very important. All right. So in the design of the transfer ellipse, the first thing to note is that the periapsis of the transfer ellipse is point A, right? The transfer ellipse is tangential to the initial orbit at point A and point A is the point of closest approach for TE. So we have that the periapsis RP for the transfer ellipse equals R1, which is the radius of the initial orbit. And we know that the periapsis is given by AT, A times one minus E with the T subscript for the transfer ellipse, okay? Which can also be written as PT in terms of the parameter over one plus E, right? Because PT is A one minus E square. All right. Now the point B is in some way you can look at it as a design parameter, right? Because uh, by controlling the location of point B, we are in some way saying that we are we are some way we are some way in some way controlling the length of the transfer arc. Because if point B is taken to be here, which is the apoapsis of the final orbit. If point B is over there, you get the Hohmann transfer, right? Because the transfer arc then subtends an angle phi equal to 180 degrees. As we cause this point B to recede away from the apoapsis of OF and closer towards point A, we are making the transfer shorter and shorter, okay? So by controlling the location of point B, which can be characterized using the angle phi, we are controlling how fast the transfer takes place between OI and OF. So we are going to say that phi controls speed of transfer, right? And is therefore a design input. This is a design parameter. All right. So what we can do is, see, uh, we are trying to design the transfer ellipse, right? So we have the unknowns AT and ET, which are orbital elements of the transfer ellipse. They're both unknown. So right now we have one equation, equation one, in terms of two unknowns, AT and ET, or PT and ET, whichever you want to choose. So we need at least one more equation. Right? So we can use point B to generate that second equation and let the radius uh, magnitude of point B from focus be R2. Okay? So R2 from the equation of orbit, equation of orbit as applied to the transfer ellipse is equal to PT over 1 plus ET cos F where F is the true anomaly of the point B on the transfer ellipse, but the true anomaly of point B on the transfer ellipse is phi, which comes from the assumption that the transfer ellipse shares the line of apsides with the final orbit, okay? So this gives me a second equation in which the unknowns are PT and ET, and phi is known because point two says that, you know, we are, we are controlling the speed of transfer uh, by controlling the magnitude of phi. So it's a design parameter and it's, it's, a, it's an input. Now the question is that what about R2, right? Do we know R2? And the answer is yes, because I can write the equation of orbit involving point B also for the final orbit, right? This is the equation of orbit as applied to the transfer ellipse. I can do the same thing for the final orbit and everything about the final orbit is known because we know where we are going, that's our destination. 
right? So R2 again equation of orbit becomes PF as applied to the final orbit over 1 plus EF cos F true anomaly of point B on the final orbit which is also phi which is a crucial which will you know which which holds true because of that our, our crucial assumption that the line of abscites is common so the true anomaly of point B is again me measured from the same line on the final orbit as well right so PF and EF are orbital elements of the final orbit they are known and so is phi which is a design parameter so R2 is known right R2 is known by fixing phi so what we get is that I put in this R2 over here it becomes a known and so I have two unknowns now PT and ET and two equations equation 1 and equation 3 all right so we can solve this system of two equations and two unknowns to solve for PT and ET I'm going to erase this now and once I solve those two equations I get the following answer so what we get is that ET the eccentricity of the transfer ellipse is equal to R2 minus R1 upon R1 minus R2 cos phi and PT is R1 R2 R1 minus R2 cos phi multiplied by 1 minus cos phi And we already noted earlier that R2 is a known through the equation of orbit as applied to the final orbit. This is known. So we get the expressions for ET and PT. And of course, you can uh, find the, uh, the semi major axis as follows. We are going to need the semi-major axis, obviously, to find the velocities in uh, in the Vis-Viva equation. All right, so that completes the design of the transfer ellipse. Note that we don't have to find the you know the uh, orientation orbital para parameters for the transfer ellipse, and we have you know not found them even for the Hohmann transfer or the bielectric transfer for the reason that we are assuming coplanar maneuvers, right? So uh, since the 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 plane doesn't really change. We don't need to know what the inclination is, what the longitude of ascending node and so on are, because those are irrelevant. They're going to remain the same throughout this process. All right. So the step two in the non Hohmann transfer is to look at the first burn, burn, right? So remember, this is like the Hohmann transfer. This is a two impulse burn, but of course, uh, the difference is going to be that it won't be as a fuel efficient as the Hohmann transfer, uh, but it will save us some time. All right, so the step two is the first burn, which is delta V at point A. Like we mentioned earlier, this one is uh, relatively easy because uh, the delta V at point A is a tangential delta V, right? Because the transfer ellipse is tangential to the circle, the initial circle. Now, VI, which is the speed on the initial orbit, is mu over R1. It's a circular orbit. And V, I'm going to call TA, which is the speed of point A on the transfer ellipse, through the vis VY equation is... <clears throat> mu 2 over r1 minus 1 over at we already found at in the previous uh, uh, step right so since this is a tangential burn and looking at the picture i see that vta is greater than vi because it's a faster orbit it needs to you know, go further out uh, 
it's a bigger orbit I'm sorry so it, uh, the transfer ellipse is a bigger orbit so I need more speed here more kinetic energy that will allow it to go further out than the initial orbit and so delta V A is equal to V T A minus V I okay this is equation number 22 in the notes part four, part four I think it is that we are at right now all right so this is a tangential burn and takes care of the first delta V so uh, the next step which is also the final step in this non Hohmann transfer is the most uh, crucial one and it is also the most involved because we are looking like we saw in the previous you know the, the, the big figure three we are looking not just at the change of uh, magnitude but also a change of direction of the velocity vector okay so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to call this delta VB uh, VB uh, vector with the underline and you try to figure out what this vector is and uh, then we will find the magnitude by just you know taking the norm of that vector all right so this delta VB is the difference between this the velocity vector on the final orbit and the transfer ellipse right so delta VB vector is VFB which is the velocity vector of uh, point B on the final orbit minus VTB which is the velocity vector of point B on the transfer ellipse right so let me draw this here this is VTB and maybe this is VFB and so here's your V delta B vector. All right, so we need these vectors to complete uh, the non Hohmann transfer. So, since you know everything is coplanar, it makes sense to expand or to uh, uh, to express these vectors in the orbital frame. And uh, what we will do is. Uh, we will use the local r and theta frame okay so recall that a velocity vector v can be written as r dot er plus r f dot ef right this is the er ef frame uh, this is the rate unit radial vector uh, unit radial uh, vector and this is the uh, unit theta vector which is perpendicular to ER and it is it, it is in the direction of the true anomaly right so this comes from our earlier discussion on the two-body problem and also what we had found in you know when we were looking at the two-body problem is we had found expressions for R dot and RF dot and r dot was square root mu over p e sine f and f dot we had found to be square root mu p over r square so r f dot will be square root mu p over r now if you look at page 14 of the notes I have provided a proof you know very short proof for these two expressions we have already done this earlier okay so uh, I'm not going to repeat that here we already know how to derive uh, these two equations okay so we have uh, expression for the velocity vector v uh, in the er ef uh, orbital plane reference frame and we have expressions for these individual components r dot and r f dot the question is what about these unit vectors now uh, this is where again that assumption about a common line of abscisse will become very important so <clears throat> e r is in the direction of the radius vector at the local point right see the point that we are concerned with is b 
for both the final and the transfer ends, final orbit and the transfer ends, right? So the unit vector, radial vector at point B goes like that, right? So I'm going to call this ER. Now EF is in the direction of the true anomaly, right? Now the final orbit and the transfer ellipse share a common line of apsides, which means that the point B, I'm saying this for the nth time, but uh, the fact is that point B shares, uh, I'm sorry, has the same true anomaly on both the final orbit and the transfer ellipse, right? So this vector, unit vector, which is in the direction of the true anomaly, uh, the direction in which the true anomaly is measured is also going to be the same for the transfer ellipse and the final orbit at point B. Okay, somewhere it's perpendicular to ER, I'm going to say this is EF, and ER and EF, whatever they are, they are the same for both the transfer ellipse and the final orbit. Okay, so in the notes, I have done some analysis. If you look at page 14 of part four, uh, I have actually expanded ER and EF, equation 27, page 14, in terms of the eccentricity vector and the unit Y vector. And uh, after expanding the ER and EF vectors in terms of the eccentricity unit vector and the Y unit vector, I get somewhat uh, complicated looking expressions for these two velocity vectors VFB and VTB. So those are equations 31 and 32. Okay, so that is on page 15. However, you don't really need to do that because uh, of course the eccentricity vector are the same for the transfer ellipse and the final orbit. So these expressions, uh, equations 31 and 32, are somewhat more complicated than they need to be, okay, uh, for VFB and VTB. So we will not use those. We will jump to page 16 in which I let this expression in terms of ER and EF remain, okay, and not expand ER and EF further. So use this expression for V and plug in point B on the final orbit and point B on the transfer ellipse, okay? So let's do that. So again, to summarize what we are doing now is in the notes, we are going to jump uh, equations 27 through 32, okay? And say that, you know, that all that complex analysis is not really needed. So once you have equation number 26, jump straight ahead to equation number 33, okay? And let us just continue using this equation in terms of ER and EF, all right? So, from those expressions, we have VFB. VFB is equal to square root mu over PF. We are looking at point B on the final orbit. EF, sine F we have, but F is the true anomaly and we know that the true anomaly of point B is phi, no matter if it's on the transfer ellipse or on the final orbit. All right, so ER plus square root mu pf over r2 ef and in this, using the same uh, set of expressions for the transfer ellipse at point b we have mu over pt we already found pt in the design of the transfer ellipse et sine f but sine F is again the same for point B since the line of apsides is shared. ER is the same unit vector on the transfer ellipse plus 
mu pt over r2 ef and same all right so these are equations 33 a and b in the notes and so what we are going to do next is use these two expressions and substitute them back over here to find the expression for delta vb okay so it becomes actually it becomes pretty straightforward once we have these expressions so let me get rid of them now and substitute into the delta vb equation to get that delta vb therefore equals square root mu ef or root pf minus et root pt times sine phi er <coughs> plus square root mu over r2 square root pf minus square root pt Okay, this is equation number 34 in the notes. And that's it, right? We have the vector. See, all of these quantities are known. All the F quantities, meaning EF, PF, are known because those are uh, parameters of the or you know, orbital elements of the final orbit, which are which is a known destination. And all the T uh, variables, ET and PT, are orbital elements of the transfer ellipse which you've already designed and of course phi again is a design parameter r2 is also known so we know delta vb and therefore we can compute the magnitude of the delta v at this point by taking the norm of this above vector and that gives us delta vb all right so to conclude, the total delta V for the non-Hohmann non -Hohmann transfer between OI and OF is going to be delta VA plus delta VB that we just found, the magnitude. Okay. <coughs> All right. Now, if you look at this picture, uh, there is a little bit more physical insight that we can get into the second burn. All right. So you see that there is a change of magnitude that is involved uh, between VTB and VFB. And also there is a change of uh, uh, orientation of the velocity vector. Right. So there is a rotation involved. So let me zoom into that part of the picture and draw it again. So here's, uh, let's see, <clears throat> here's the focus F and let me call this point B. Okay, that's point B. So this is my ER because it is along the radius vector and let this be EF. Now, if the velocity vector at point B is V, then we know that this angle is the angle gamma, which is the flight path angle, right? The flight path angle of the velocity vector at point B. So why is this, why is it the flight path angle? Remember that uh, the FPA is the angle of the velocity vector above the local horizon, right? ER points straight towards zenith, right? So it looks straight up, therefore it is normal to the local horizon which is defined by the EF vector. And therefore this is the angle gamma that the velocity vector makes 
above the local horizon and therefore is the flight path angle. Okay, so from that we see that tan gamma, tan of the flight path angle is equal to the ER component of the velocity vector divided by EF component of the velocity vector and we already have expressions for those two, right? ER component is R dot and EF component is RF dot. Right. So this rotation of the velocity vector from VTB to VFB can be described in terms of the change in the flight path angle of the velocity vector at point B. Okay, because we have expressions for both those components. Alright, so Unfortunately, I have to get rid of this. I have much space here. So, what I can do is I can find the flight path angle of tan gamma of the point B on the final orbit. Right? The flight path angle is R dot over FB over R FB F dot FB. And we have expressions for these. So look at equation number 36. I'm going to give you the final form R2 over PF EF sine phi. Okay, that's the tan of the flight path angle of point P on the final orbit. And similarly, tan of the flight path angle of point P on the transfer ellipse is R2 over PT. E t sine phi. All right. And so the rotation angle between VFB and angle between VFB vector and VTB vector is the angle by which this the flight path changes. And so this is tan inverse. <coughs> R2 PF EF sine phi minus tan inverse R2 P T E T sine phi. Okay, this is the angle by which the velocity vector was rotated in this process. Alright. Okay. So to <coughs> Uh, implement all this on all the stuff that we've learned about non-home and fast transfers let us do an example problem and in the example problem we will also look at one aspect that we have not really looked at here is what is the time the actual time of transfer between point A and B you know that that was the original motivation for this right because we were trying to save time over the home and transfer which we considered to be too slow all right so let us look at an example problem and we'll compute all that so here's the example problem. We have the uh, initial and final orbits that are both circles. Okay, so we have kind of gone back to our uh, Hohmann paradigm because you know I'd like to compare this with the Hohmann transfer. And uh, so let's do a transfer between two circular orbits, which are coplanar. And the initial orbit is an altitude of has an altitude of uh, 300 kilometers. And the final orbit is also circular as an altitude of 2000 kilometers. Okay, so this is not to scale obviously. And here's, you know, it doesn't really matter, uh, there's no upside, line of upside, so it was, but uh, let's use that as the reference. And I have a transfer ellipse and a transfer arc. Okay, this is my transfer arc intersects the final orbit here and the rest of the ellipse okay. that is never traversed now according to the design the transfer angle is 90 degrees that's phi that's a given angle that we know okay that's by design all right so this is point a and point B and again if phi was 180 degrees we would have the standard Hohmann transfer 
but we have we have cut down the transfer angle by half and also what is known is that the initial radius is r1 well we know, you know that corresponds to 300 kilometers altitude and r2 is corresponds to 2000 kilometers altitude uh, what we have to do is we have to find how much time is saved by cutting the transfer angle in half from 180 to 90 degrees right how much time is saved over the Hohmann transfer and also at the same time we would like to know how much additional delta V is needed over the Hohmann transfer to achieve that time saving alright so remember the step one was to find to design this transfer ellipse so step one is to design the transfer ellipse and we need ET and A and PT so ET is R2 minus R1 use that expression R1 minus R2 cos phi phi is 90 degrees so we get an interesting expression here right cos of 90 is 0 so this becomes equal to uh, R2 minus R1 over R1 which is R2 over R1 minus 1 Alright, so this is very interesting. R2 over R1 is the ratio of the final radius to the initial radius. So, look at this expression. Uh, this expression came about because cos, uh, the angle phi was 90 degrees. Okay. So, what we are seeing is that if R2 is more than twice the radius of the initial orbit, then this transfer orbit is actually not an ellipse, right? It becomes a hyperbola, right? Because if R2 is 2 times R1, then you get a parabola. And for R2 greater than 2 times R1, you get a hyperbola. So what we are seeing is that in order to get this time saving, we need to increase the energy so much that the transfer ellipse is actually a transfer hyperbola, okay? And if what you will find is that if the angle cos of the, the angle phi is reduced even further, it makes the transfer more and more difficult, right? You have to get a steeper and steeper hyperbola. Uh, the ellipse, the transfer ellipse may not even be possible, okay, because you're asking for too much, too short a transfer. Alright? So that is what explains the fact that you know you don't really get an ellipse, you get a parabola or a hyperbola. All right, so we get ET and then PT, use the expression again, and you find that PT is actually equal to R2 because of the fact that phi is equal to 90 degrees. And so this is 8378.14, corresponding to 2000 kilometers altitude kilometers. Okay, and therefore you get that AT the same major axis is pt over 1 minus e square and that is uh, 8958.7 kilometers by the way uh, for the present case r2 over r1 is 1.2546 so the eccentricity is 2 point i'm sorry 0.2546 all right so now the next step is step two is to compute the del delta v at point a now like we saw that this is the easy part because the first burn is tangential to the initial orbit and we have that vi is step two compute delta v a vi is square root mu over r1 Plug in R1 to get 7.73 kmps and VTA is through this viva 2 over R1 minus uh, I'm sorry 1 over AT and this turns out to be 8.65 kmps and so combine these two gives delta VA is the difference of the two and that is 927.6 meters per second okay so about well less than one kilometer per second 
Step three is the, tan uh, is the non tangential burn, which involves both change in magnitude and rotation. So let's look at the velocity vector. Um, so this delta Vf, uh, delta Vb vector we have seen is Vfb minus Vtb. Okay, so let's go step by step and find each one of these two. So Vfb is the velocity of point V on the final orbit. And from our expression earlier, we have square root mu Pf Ef sine P Er plus square root mu Pf over R2 Ef. Now this is a special case because you know we had assumed that the final orbit is a ellipse but it is a circle here so Ef is zero right so this term goes away and we have a purely tangential velocity to the orbit right and Pf we found was equal to R2 so the velocity vector at point B uh, on the final orbit has zero radial component right that's what we argued here and the tangential component is 6.90 kilometers per second so the zero is important okay moving forward let's look at <coughs> Vtb vector. Again, the same expression, but use the. See, this is an ellipse, so the radial component will not be zero. And just plug in the numbers, and you get 1.7. This is equation 46, page 20 of the notes. 76 and 6.89. <clears throat> I'm uh, sorry, 6.90 kmps. All right, so. Our delta VB vector is VFB minus VTB, that is negative 1.760 0 kmps. Okay? And therefore, the magnitude computation becomes easy because you know, one of the components is 0. So the magnitude is nothing but the radial component and that is delta Vb norm delta Vb vector 1.76 kilometers per second. Okay, so the total delta V, delta V non-Hohmann is delta Va plus delta Vb. So that was around 926 meters per second plus 1.76 kilometers per second. And that gives me 2.68 kmps. Okay, that's the total delta V we need for the designed uh, short transfer. And uh, also you can you know find the rotation in the velocity vector, just plug in uh, the, uh, the numbers and the expressions for the flight path angle and you will find that delta gamma the rotation is around 14.3 degrees that was the rotation in the velocity vector that was needed all right so the next important thing is to find the amount of time needed for this maneuver right because that's what we're trying to save so let's get an idea of how much time is involved in this transfer so, you know, whenever we have time and we are talking ellipses, we are basically looking at the Kepler's equation. But the Kepler's equation, uh, we have the benign form of the Kepler's equation that we need to look at because the unknown is time and not the eccentric anomaly. So we don't have to do any iterative procedures. Uh, so from the Kepler's equation, N, TB, is the final point minus ta is the initial point the time of flight between these two points on the transfer ellipse obviously 
is equal to the mean anomaly of point B minus mean anomaly of point A. Right? That's why that's our Kepler's equation. <clears throat> and this is the unknown right here, it's the time of flight. <clears throat> So we need to know what MB and MA are first, the mean anomalies. Now by definition, again, the mean anomaly is E minus E sine E, E T sine E D. We are using E T because we not need to know the time of flight on the transfer ellipse, right? And similarly, MA is E A minus E T sine E A. This is by definition of the mean anomaly. Now, <clears throat> also recall that uh, there's a relationship between E and F, which is the true anomaly. So that relationship is the following. Tan E over 2 is a factor plus 1 plus E T tan F over 2. So we, we have to look at two points, point A and point B. Now, if you look at figure 3, you see that point A is the periapsis of the transfer ellipse, right? So at the periapsis, the true anomaly, F, is 0. And therefore, from this expression, E, A, the eccentric anomaly of point A is 0, right? So plug in 0 here, and you get that the mean anomaly of point A is 0. Okay. So all that is left is uh, the eccentric anomaly of point B. That we can find easily from this expression, the tan EB equals uh, this factor times FB, but FB is nothing but, again, phi, right? That is the true anomaly of point B. Since phi is known and we've already computed ET, therefore EB is known, plug that, find EB and plug that over here, so that MB is known, right? And look at equation 51. Uh, MB turns out to be 1.07. <clears throat> okay, so MB and MA are both known. N is known, obviously, because N is uh, the mean motion, it's 2 pi over P and we are talking the transfer ellipse. So that's PT. We know the same major axis of uh, the transfer ellipse, so we know PT and therefore we know N. And therefore from here then, we get that TB minus TA, which is our time of flight or the time of transfer, the non human transfer, is uh, So TB minus TA equals about 23.9 minutes. This is equation 52. All right, so you know we are spending about 24 minutes to go from uh, an orbit of altitude 300 kilometers to an altitude of 2,000 kilometers, which is not too bad. All right. Now, uh, how good it is will. Uh, we will know once we compare it with the Hohmann transfer. So the first thing to look at is the delta V of the Hohmann transfer. You plug in the expression for VI and the ratio of the orbits. Okay, this is equation 53 on page 21. This is only 825.5 meters per second. Okay. Now what we found for this non-Hohmann was you know, about three times this. So delta V non Hohmann non Hohmann by three. Right? So the pr so the first thing that we are saying is whatever the time saving is, the price that we are paying in terms of the additional delta V is uh, is uh, three times uh, the delta V of the Hohmann transfer. Okay, so we are you know we are, we have a hundred percent increase in the delta V that is needed, okay, which is quite drastic. 
And if you look at the time delta t of the home and transfer, we all know this is p transfer over 2, half the period. And p transfer obviously depends on the semi major axis of the transfer ellipse, at cube. This is home end, so at h over mu. And at, you know, is the mean, uh, jo jo uh, sorry, the arithmetic mean of the initial and final orbits. So this turns out to be about 54.2 minutes. Okay. So look at these two numbers. You are basically saving something like 30 minutes of time, right? Between the home and transfer and the non home and transfer. And that 30 minutes uh, is uh, about 56% of the home and transfer. So you're saving 56% in time but having to pay a penalty of 100% in delta v okay so you know the question of whether it's worth it or not is answered by what is the need at the time right you're you're doing this fast transfer maybe you're trying to respond to a spacecraft that is in distress so it may be worth it or it may not be worth it depending on you know what is the what is the uh, demand at the time now I what I have done in figures 4 and 5 is repeated this same analysis uh, for a variety of the transfer angle okay so I have uh, kind of uh, varied the length of the transfer arc by varying the fee value from around 55 degrees to 180 degrees and of course at 180 degrees the maneuver becomes exactly equal to a home and transfer so if you look at figure 4 first in figure 4 page 24 you will see at phi equal to 180 degrees the time saved is zero which is obvious right because at that uh, uh, in in that configuration you are essentially doing a home and transfer so there is no saving over the home and transfer and in figure 5 again uh, for phi equal to 180 degrees you see that the excess delta v needed is also zero because you know it's, it's the same as the home transfer and as phi increases right the time saved goes down because the shorter the phi the faster this process is because the steeper the curve is uh, the steeper the transfer arc uh, transfer arc is right so you're going there faster so you're saving about uh, 43 minutes uh, for fee equal to 55 you know if, so if you look at here uh, 43 54 minus 43 is 11 so you are doing the transfer for fee equal to 55 degrees which is the leftmost point on figure 4 you are essentially doing the transfer in about 11 minutes which is quite impressive right going from 300 kilometers altitude to 2000 kilometers altitude in about 11 minutes but of course the delta extra delta v needed from figure 5 you see is in the in excess of around 6.5 kilometers per second which is you know quite excessive so in this lecture there is one last concept that i uh, want to cover and it is the difference between an intercept and a rendezvous Okay, so in what we have done so far in all the orbital maneuvers that we've studied is that there is always a final delta V that is performed, right? So consider these two orbits, or circular orbits, and suppose this is the transfer that is designed, okay? <clears throat> so this is obviously a non Hohmann transfer as you can see this is a short arc and it subtends less than 180 degrees now the point is that we perform a delta V here at point A and a delta V at point B the job of delta V at point B is to transfer the spacecraft from this transfer orbit to the final orbit right so if the one way to think about it is that this burn 
is matching the position the velocity vector of the spacecraft with the velocity vector that as it should be on the final orbit right if this burn was not conducted then the spacecraft would just shoot past it would cross point b right because by design this transfer orbit intersects the final orbit at point b okay so that point b has been hit and we say that hitting a point in space is called interception okay but we also perform a burn there and what that does is that not only is the position vector matched but the velocity vector is also matched right you are making the spacecraft get transferred into this final orbit now what can happen sometimes is that this transfer arc from A to B was designed for a particular purpose and that purpose was that when this spacecraft S1 reached point B there was going to be another spacecraft present there S2 and the objective is simply to hit that spacecraft okay so maybe destroy it or whatever so the objective is to hit a point B in space at some point in time okay so if you think of that objective we don't really need to perform the second delta V right that's delta V B because the only objective was to hit the point B and once you've done that the mission is accomplished right so maneuvers like that in which the final delta V is not performed and the objective is only to hit a point in space match only the radius vector right so the radius vector on the transfer orbit is the same as the radius vector on the final orbit that has already been matched and so that type of maneuver is called an intercept okay uh, and this tra transfer arc will be called an intercept trajectory so this has been explained in uh, page 23 of the notes and but this is not what we have, been, we have been doing so far right what we have done so far is what what is called a rendezvous maneuver in which suppose there is a spacecraft there present okay so s2 the job for s1 is not only to hit s2 but to meet it with zero relative velocity right so that the meeting is smooth right if they have a relative velocity vector then they will collide with with each other which is the intercept maneuver but in the rendezvous they come together and not only do their position vectors match but also their velocity vectors are also the same okay so you get a smooth uh, uh, meeting of the of the two objects in what is known as a rendezvous okay so here in an intercept match only the radius vectors okay which implies no need for final burn delta v but in a rendezvous you need to match both r and v and therefore the final delta v must be performed and this is what we've been doing all along right <clears throat> but i just wanted to make the distinction uh, because uh, you know for especially for uh, uh, missile applications uh, the the final delta v is not needed you just need to go and hit a point in space completing what is known as an intercept maneuver all right so there is actually a third type of maneuver as well right so you have intercept which is the most crude type of maneuver in which only matching r is sufficient then you have rendezvous in which you match not just the position vectors but also the velocity vector so the, you know the meeting is smooth then the third type which is the most demanding okay so from the most crude to the most demanding is called docking okay in docking you not only do not only do you need to match the position and the velocity vectors but also the attitudes of the spacecraft so that you can come and you know lock into each other like uh, they used to do in the in the lunar missions okay so uh, 
that is one aspect that we have not looked at in this course at all because we have all along assumed that all spacecraft are point masses and point masses don't have attitudes right so you know in the in the follow-up course which i'm teaching in fall we will look at attitude dynamics of spacecraft and there uh, we will look at um, uh, how to change the attitude of spacecraft using you know various control schemes so uh, we will talk about docking problems okay so just to give you a preview here the third type is docking and here you need to match R V the attitude which is represented maybe using Euler angles or quaternions or Rodriguez parameters you know whatever you have call it Q and the time derivatives okay so that is the most demanding problem all right 